I'm Danny Thujai from Poetry Corner and Elmwood Productions, and you're watching that maniac, Rich the Claws, here on the Claws Corner. Check it out or be a loser. Loser. Welcome to the latest episode of The Claws Corner. Today's guest is an American author and editor of horror, dark fantasy, and science fiction. His novels include The Little Sleep, The Harlequin and the Train, No Sleep to Wonderland, Swallowing a Donkey's Eye, A Head Full of Ghosts, Disappearance of Devil's Rock, The Cabin at the End of the World, Survivor Song, The Paul Bears Club, and The Beast You Are. His most recent work is, was released today, September 26, 2023. It's entitled In Bloom and is part of the Creature Feature Collection, which features stories from some of today's best authors. So what the hell am I waiting for? Let's get right to it. <laughs> Please welcome the extremely talented Paul Tremblay to the Claws Corner. Paul, how are you? Well, thank you, Rich. I really, uh, very, um, I'm good. Glad to be here. Sorry, I'm stumbling. I'm still getting used to being back in school, so my brain might be a little mushy. Well, that was the one thing I left out. Not only are you a writer, editor, you had your one of your books adapted into. Well, you did. You had a busy year. You were also a yeah. full time teacher, so that's not even your full time job. So you are a busy man. Yeah, well, I think at this point it's sort of two full time jobs. Although I will admit, last year I was able to take a year sabbatical, which was nice. So that's why coming back this year has been a little bit like, whoa, how did I do this before? I'll figure it out though. I think. Well, <laughs> well whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. And I, I, as I mentioned to you off the air, um, today was part of the Creature Feature Collection, and you have a story entitled "In Bloom." I, it was available on Kindle and Audible right now. Right. I loved it. I listened to it. Oh, thank you. And you, I got to tell you, my parents um, live in Cape Cod, so I yeah. love this story. And it was funny because um, they live right down the street in West Dennis from. Uh, Oh, it was a good friend's diner. I was laughing because so, I go there all the time when I visit them. <laughs> and without giving anything away, oh yeah, yeah, right. I, I do want to say that next time I'm stuck on either the Sagamore Bridge or the Bourne Bridge, I'm going to think a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not like those bridges already aren't terrifying enough for anyone who's not from the area. Uh, there's only two ways to get onto the Cape uh, Cape Cod or these two bridges over the canal. You know, they both go like 170 feet high, and they're really narrow, and the lanes are narrow. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not a happy bridge to be on. At least yeah. I'm not happy when I'm on them. <laughs> no, there's. I mean, it usually takes about. I live in Connecticut. It takes about three hours to get there. One time it took me six and a half hours because oh, I was. I can believe it. Was it. A Saturday or Sunday morning, and it's just like I'm never ever going that time again. But yeah. so for people that didn't have a chance to either listen to it or read it yet, um, what's the premise? Oh, geez, uh, I'm so bad at the at the elevator pitch. But the premise is it, it opens with. Uh, a, a young journalist, a woman in her early 30s named Heidi Stone, is traveling to Cape Cod to, to work on her story about, you know, the effects of algae blooms on both freshwater and, you know, saltwater uh, around in and around the Cape, which is, you know, sort of a real, you know, a real life thing uh, that, you know, that's happening now that where all these nitrates plus, you know, the raised temperatures are creating these poisonous blooms, these blue algae blooms. Um and so while she's there, she sort of pointed towards a guy named Jimmy Lang. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because he's 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 really a stand-in for John Lang, a uh, writer and good friend. Um, and, and Jimmy Lang has a strange story to tell her about what had happened near a pond in the 80s. So I don't want to spoil too much, but since yeah. it's a creature feature sort of collection of stories, there is some sort of monster, uh, you know, that emerges to to run rampant through the Cape. <laughs> Well, you know, another reason I like this, because I'm a huge fan of the movies of the 70s, and especially like back then it was pollution and nature getting back at the humans, like Day of the Animals, right. The Swarm, Frog, all those great movies. So that reminded me, without giving anything away, it just sort of reminded me a mm. little bit of that too. Brought me back to like growing up in the 70s, watching those movies, which I love. And uh, so, so I think Creature Feature Collection is a perfect name for that because from what I've met you several times, and the last time I met you was at a book signing in yeah. New Hampshire, and you said that that was watching Creature Feature at age six was your introduction to horror. Yeah, so uh, in you know, in so I'm in Massachusetts. You said you're in Connecticut, but you probably yeah. maybe had this too. Yeah, uh, but like for the Boston, this is how old it was. <laughs> the Boston UHF channel, Channel Fifty Six. Oh yeah, on Saturday on Saturday afternoons would show Creature Double Feature, and yeah, that was sort of my, you know, I. I, I watched it because the first movie was always a kaiju movie, always Godzilla or Rodan or Gamera. 
And that's what, I, you know, as a kid who liked dinosaurs, I love those movies. But then the second movie was more of a straightforward horror movie. You know, usually B movies from the 50s or, you know, hammer horror films. And those movies scared the crap out of me. Um, but yeah, that was sort of my my hook, my intro into horror. It's funny you mention it because I just had this conversation the other day with somebody. I said, to me, the scariest Dracula was Christopher Lee growing up with oh, those red eyes. Definitely. Evil. I mean, I yeah. love Bela Lugosi and I love Frank Langella, some of the other Draculas, but the one that scared the shit out of me was Christopher Lee growing up. He was in the Hammer films. I love all of those movies. Absolutely. Terrifying. Yeah. I mean, because of Christopher Lee, I was more afraid of like Frank Langella and, yeah. and the other ones. But yeah, no, Christopher Lee to me is definitely the scariest vampire. Yeah. And I'll tell you what my introduction to horror was. I guess if you, if you want to consider it horror was I was seven years old, 1975. My father, I have two brothers. I'm the oldest. My father said, hey, do you guys want to go to school? Would you rather see Jaws? We ended <laughs> up seeing Jaws 17 times in the theater that summer. I remember it so Whoa. clearly. And my teacher said, so Rich, were you sick yesterday? I said, no, we went to go see Jaws. And my, they called our house. My father said, I told you to lie. Yeah. <laughs> and what was, wow. what was great about that movie, because it came full circle for me, because as I mentioned to you off the year, my parents live in Cape Cod, and I'm sure everybody knows yeah. Jaws was filmed in Martha's Vineyard. And so I go to Martha's Vineyard, and they, ha they, they haven't had them recently, but they used to have these Jaws fests. So the first time I went, I was wearing a shirt that had Hooper in a cage, and this woman comes up to me. I have no idea who she is. Well, let me go back a little bit. The only thing that scared me in Jaws, what scared me the most was the Ben Gardner head when Hooper goes down to the yeah, boat. Finds sure. it. So every time it would happen, I would turn my head, wait for it to be over. So this woman comes up to me and she goes, oh, that's a really cool shirt. So thanks. She, I said, and so we were talking for a while and they said, all right, Christy, need you to come up to the front. We're going to start. And I said, boy, it seems like you know people. I want to hang out with you. She goes, come on. Huh. So I get there. There's Deputy Hendricks on my right side. The one who played uh, Alice Kittner on my left said, maybe she does know people. Yeah. So afterwards, she goes, you know, what? I like you. You have a great sense of humor. I want your number. I said, all right. So we, the next morning she calls me up. She goes, do you know who I am? I said, no. She goes, you know the guy who played Ben Gardner? Yeah. That was my father. So we became oh. friends. Yeah, I said, your father scared the shit out of me. <laughs> we became friends. I went to Martha's Vineyard so many times, took my father over there. And she brought us to all the locations where they filmed all the behind the scenes stories. So it was, I, 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 Jaws is still one of my all time favorite movies. Oh, that's amazing. No, mine too. Oh, that's a great story. That's so cool. And yeah, you know what? Speaking of that, in this story, without saying too much about it, you have yeah. couple Jaws references, which I love. I was laughing. Oh, for sure. That too. <laughs> yeah. No, there's definitely references to Jaws. It's, yeah. Maybe Jaws mixed with another sort of classic 50s horror movie uh, monster. But yeah, no, uh, uh, you know, I've seen, I, I, I didn't see it 17 times in the theater, that's for sure. Uh, but I have, you know, definitely seen it over 50 times. You know, so the Ben Gardner scene is scary. You know, it's a good jump scare, but I still can't watch Quint getting eaten in half, eaten in half at the end. Because when I saw it as a 10 year old or 11, I forget which, yeah. uh, that broke my brain. It gave me shark nightmares. You know, I'm not exaggerating, you know, up through high school. So there's still a part of me as an adult, even though I've seen way more gorier things. Yeah. That fears if I watch Quint and really it's him spitting the blood in the camera was the part that made me freak out. Uh, I feel like if I watch that again, I fear reverting to that kid that has all the shark nightmares every night because I don't want any, I don't want shark nightmares. Well, you know, it's funny. I remember that scene so clearly watching it in the theater and when that jump, the shark jumped up onto the boat, my mother went, ah, she screamed so <laughs> loud. It made everybody else scream. I, I, it was such a phenomenon. I mean, that was the first major summer blockbuster ever. Oh, yeah. And that movie changed. Yeah, changed how everything. Hollywood put movies out in the summer, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you and I are, I think, very similar, like in age group. So we grew up watching all the same things, it seems like. I want to talk about the last release because you had. Uh -huh. The cool thing it was called The Beast You Are. It was a short yes. story collection. I love that. I want to get into some of the stories. But before that, I want to talk about what you did because I saw you at a book signing in New Hampshire. And I know you were going from, I love the way you did this. When I saw you, you had <laughs> Joe Hill, who lives in New Hampshire, interview yeah. you. And then you go to, you know, I think two days later, you were in Providence, Rhode Island. You had whoever was the big author in that um, city interview you. So every city you went to, you had an author who was big in that, who lived there, interview. Was that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the times it wasn't necessarily they were the interviewer. I think sometimes it was just like, hey, we're splitting, uh, you know, we're sharing an event. You know, yeah. in Joe's case, he didn't have anything new out. Uh, and that was more set up by my publisher. Um, I mean, I could have asked Joe personally, but Joe and I share an editor. So yeah. that was sort of an easy. It was very nice of Joe to serve as the interviewer. You know, and I try to do the same thing. Like I'm, uh, geez, I just did an interview. I just did a couple of, or I'm the interviewer sort of events and i'm doing another one like in uh october for a debut novelist molly mcgee 
Uh, yeah, no, yeah, those are kind of fun to do. But yeah, thank you. No, I mean, I think you get, you're you're more likely to get more people there if you have two writers there than just one. So, you know, it's just to try not to have an empty room. Yeah, no, it was great. And I loved, because I mean, I'm a huge Joe Hill fan as well. And I, just loved, I mean, I met him several times too. And actually had a chance to interview Owen King for this show a couple of years ago. So I just, I mean, it was great to go down there and listen to his stories, listen to your stories. And Thanks. Was, yeah, that was a fun night. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about a couple of stories that's, that's called The Beast You Are. One of them, um, you have several callbacks to uh, the book that first I was first introduced to you uh, with was A Head Full of Ghosts. Yeah. One was called The Blogger in the Postal Zone, um, The Possessed Edition. It was Karen Bristle. She was in that one. Um, that is a great story. And I love this. Thank you. So that's, that, where'd the premise for that come from? So I want to talk about um, that first, and then we'll get into yeah. it. Yeah. So... You know, I, I've, you know, I guess never say never, but, you know, in my head, it's like I would never write a, a, a direct sequel to A Head Full of Ghosts. But, you know, within that novel, the two sisters, part of their relationship is that they tell each other stories. So I thought it would still be fun, even though the novel's over. It's like, oh, I could still have, I could still write stories that these sisters tell to each other. And, you know, it'd be kind of fun for people who have read A Head Full of Ghosts, because there's that little callback. But also, if you haven't read A Head Full of Ghosts, you don't have to have read it uh because it's just hey here's a story that sort of stands alone it's just maybe a little bit extra for a head full of ghosts because these these sisters told each other stories uh the, in the case of uh the postal zone the possession edition i think it was called yeah um geez i think i think it was like either 2018 2019 ish around there uh, fangoria uh, an editor at fangoria approached me and asked hey you know would you write a short story for the magazine because you know they did a a few issue run where they would put a short story sort of in the back of the magazine. They did, I know they did one of uh, Stephen Graham Jones. I think they had a Tanana Reeve do one in there as well. So I was like, yeah, yeah. But then I was like, oh, what the hell am I going to write for Fangoria? Um, I took a dog. I took my dog for a walk and it sort of just all hit me while I was walking. I was like, oh, wait a minute. In A Head Full of Ghosts, there's a character who's a blogger named Karen Brissett. And, Brissett, you know, you, that's it, sorry. Yeah, you, yeah it, Bristle is the name in uh, the the novella. Oh, okay. So, I mean, you weren't that far off, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in the book, you find out, oh, she, you know, she's a blogger, but she just got a job writing for Fangoria. So I thought it would be fun to have my blogger from the book, Karen, answering letters uh, about the the reality TV show that she wrote about, which is, you know, based, you know, which is in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so sort of like fun meta stuff, because the people who read Fangoria, like their postal zone is somewhat famous. It's been there forever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was fun to tell a story through notes to the editor. And then there's one person who's writing notes to the editor and it starts those those notes get progressively stranger and creepier. Well, that's why I wanted to bring the story up because I love the story and I wanted to know if any of those letters were real, if they had any kind of reality. To it. <laughs> one of them, an example, I want to bring this one up because it's uh, it was the character's name was Julie Roberts Johnson. And I laughed at this because she makes the comment. Does he not know the ending or does he not get what does he not know the ending? So he doesn't give us one. Does he not know the yeah. ending or how to end something? Very frustrating. First of all, <laughs> I disagree with Julie Roberts. Johnson. Yeah, I you. love your stories. Actually, when you do that, it makes me wanting more. It leaves me like, oh, man, I want to see. I want to read more of this. So I think it has the opposite effect. <laughs> for me. I don't get fr I get frustrated in a good way. We're like, yeah. So um, was, were things were some of these things that these characters were saying in your story really letters that were written to you? Um, so, I mean, no, no, I mean, I, I, thankfully I don't get people writing me like, although yeah. I did get one fairly, actually, I take that back. I got a message on Instagram fairly recently where it was like, Hey, you know, I'm thinking of reading survivor song, but you got to tell me if this one has an ending or something, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, of course I didn't answer that person's message. So, <laughs> you know, at the time it was more, I was just poking fun, you know, sort of at myself and whatever reputation it is I have. <laughs> um, but some of the, actually, one of the letters, I think, was definitely from, or based on an old letter that was written to an older Fangoria issue. Because I, before I wrote the the story, my brother has like a, a collection of a bunch of 1990s uh, Fangoria. So I went through and read some of the, the letters to the editor, which was kind of fun. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that was about it, like very oblique references to actual letters. It was more just, you know, having fun with the format. Yeah, which I could definitely tell you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Another story that features characters from A Head Full of Ghosts, which I loved, was Red Eyes. And it features both sisters, Marjorie and Mercy. That was another good story. Yeah. And then another one. This one didn't include any of the characters, but I love the story. I wanted to talk about this. It was The Party. And that's one of the ones where I'm like, wait, 
<laughs> How's it end? How does it end? Yeah, it just it just ended, and I love that. And you dedicated Thank you. that one to Shirley Jackson, right? So that story um, I wrote for an anthology that Ellen Datlow edited. Uh, it's called "When Things Get Dark," and the idea behind the anthology was people were writing stories inspired by Shirley Jackson's work. You know, she didn't want pastiche necessarily. Yeah, you know, but but stories that have sort of the vibe of a Shirley Jackson story. So like the core idea of that story I'd, I'd had, I'd had actually kicking around for a while, but I just didn't know what to do with it. But when she invited me to the Jackson anthology, I was like, oh, okay, this idea will be perfect. Well, hopefully perfect. Perfect enough for me to write anyway, uh, you know, for that anthology. Um, and yeah, no, I took my favorite, one of my favorite Shirley Jackson short stories, you know, and maybe not one of her most famous ones is called The Intoxicated which does take place at a party and it's just really short and really wonderful and smart and funny and creepy. And then her novel, the sundial, which again, I think is one that's not read nearly as much or as widely as obviously the haunting of Hill house. And, and um, you know, we have always lived in the castle, but the sundial again is another one where it's like these aristocrats living in a big mansion, a family that's sort of like <laughs> very cruel to each other. And, you know, and there's like a maybe weird apocalypse happening in a few days later. So that story was just sort of like a fun riff on 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 those two sort of Jackson things in particular. Now, was she one of your favorite writers growing up? Um, so I I mean she was definitely one of my favorite writers when I was reading first reading seriously and thinking of, you know, and messing around with writing. But uh, I wasn't a big reader as a kid. Uh I spent too much time watching movies and you know, I was a child of cable television. Uh and the Larry Bird Celtics <laughs> yeah. or, or just being home by myself, you know, shooting basket, you know, shooting hoops by myself in the backyard. Um, I didn't fall in love with reading until right after I graduated college. Wow. Um, yeah. So, cause I started, I was a math major as an undergrad math humanities. And then I went to graduate school for mathematics as well. But um, a couple of things, you know, sort of happened near the same time. I, one of the last classes I took as an undergraduate was a, like a lit 101 class, something a freshman should be taking, not a senior. But I had to fulfill one last requirement. But in that class, like the teacher was into punk and super cool. You know, I loved punk, so we connected that way. But in that class, I read Joyce Carol Oates's Where Have You Going? Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? And I remember reading that story and thinking, oh, I didn't know people wrote things like this. And then shortly after that, like I graduated, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, bought me Stephen King's The Stand for my birthday, mm -hmm. uh, which I inhaled and loved. So I went off to grad school for two years and my wife lived in Boston, you know, we did like the long distance relationship thing. So, uh, you know, I wasn't really going around doing much when I was in grad school. So I had all this time. So I read all the King and, you know, through King's dance macabre, especially I discovered, you know, Shirley Jackson and Clive Barker and yeah everybody else. So really, even though I, I got my master's degree in math by the skin of my teeth, it was also really like a crash course in horror fiction for me. Like yeah, a self- right. No, I found this surprising because I you you mentioned a story when I at the book signing I've met you several times and you said that, that you didn't really get it you got into reading later in life but you also got into writing later in life you really had zero interest in any of this until and then you just took off it was I mean maybe it doesn't seem fast to you but I think for other yeah. people that have been writing for years and doing this their whole life they're like wow that I mean you just really were not an instant success but it it came very quickly for you I think well compar comparatively yeah I don't know I mean. I, I, so the first story I wrote was in like 1995, 96, when yeah. I was in my 24, 25, when I first started teaching. You know, I I didn't start, I didn't sell anything until the year 2000. So I was 29 at that point. And those were short stories. Yeah. And then, you know, I got an agent in 2006. You know, that <laughs> took two years with a, with a novel. So I don't know, like I was definitely, you know, once I hit my mid 20s, I was doing all the reading and writing that I could, but, you know, didn't really experience I don't know the, whatever success I have now until much until a head full of ghosts really until much yeah. later. Well, that's when I first heard of you. And it was funny because the first place I met you was you were I was visiting my parents in Cape Cod and you were at the library over there. I said, "Oh wait, Paul oh. Tremblay's here." And I, my brother never heard of you at the time. I said, "You got to see this guy. He's a great author." Now he's looked and he reads all your books oh. too. So, yeah. Well, thanks, brother. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, brother Jeff. <laughs> yeah, brother Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> So when you first started writing, were you more interested in writing short stories, novellas, or did you go right to trying to write a novel? Oh, I mean, and it's certainly okay if you're someone who, you know, when you start writing, like you don't have to start with short stories. It's not necessarily practice yeah. with novels. Like Grady Hendrix is a great example. He Love him. You know, he just writes, not just writes novels. 
Yeah. You know, he he just recently did a short story for Amazon. So now he's doing some short stories. But anyway, with me, um, you know, aside from like the big novels I read, I was really drawn to, you know, the short stories. So I mentioned the Joyce Carol Oates one. I remember reading uh, one of her collections. And then she had this great anthology called American Gothic Fiction. Mm-hmm. And it was, um, I think it went up through like maybe the 1980s or 1990s. But, you know, it started in the late 1800s. It was one author, one story. And it was really great. So I don't know. I, I figured for me, I was like, oh, I'm going to try writing short stories. Like writing a novel to me then was like, there's no way. Like, how could I possibly do that? So, yeah, I got to make <laughs> all my mis or not all. Most of my mistakes, I shouldn't even say most, many of my mistakes, because I'm still making them, you know, with the short stories. And of course, it felt like starting over when I was trying to write novels, too. Like The Little Sleep was my first published novel in 2009, but it was the fourth and a half that I'd written. It's just, it's a little bit more easier for me to like write short stories that fail. It's easier to put them away than to spend so much time working on a novel. It's really hard to be like, oh, I guess that's just going to go away forever. But you have to remind yourself that, you know, you definitely learned something, you know, within the process of doing, of writing that. And when I first met Joe Hill, um, he, for Horns, he he said that his first novel that he wrote was like over a thousand pages. And then just, Whoa. so finally he took some of that and they said, well, how, how did you, people not realize you were Stephen King's son for so long? He goes, because I failed so many times. And he said he would take, he took a couple of that, the, what, that story and from another story and put them all together and came out with his first one. First, so it's just that he kept doing the same thing over and over. Do you, yeah. For you, do you find it more difficult to write short stories or novels? I mean, in fact, like, you know, getting character development, because you have to do a lot in a short story yeah. right away compared to a novel it could be a slow burn. Well, I mean, it's hard to compare like a single novel to a single short story in terms of like what's harder, because <laughs> just in terms of time committed to <laughs> to the to, to the story, you know, I'm going to spend 12 to 15 months yeah. before I have a draft of a novel, whereas a short story, you know, maybe I have a draft in like two to four weeks. But at the same time, like I've had short stories where I had the idea, sort of put it away or put it in a notebook and let it sort of simmer and then come back to it sometimes a year or two later. So, I mean, some things can take longer. Um, I don't know. I try not to think of them like anymore, like what's more difficult, what's harder, because they they both have their challenges. They both have their, you know, I probably shouldn't say limitations, but their expectations of the form, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I try to focus on what makes them fun to write, you know, like so a novel, you can get really expansive and, you know, sort of really dig in. Uh, where a short story to me is like the sliver in time that you're trying to write about. And really like a really like in-depth focused look at this one sort of scene, even though like there's other stuff, maybe it just builds to this one scene that's like super important for the short story. So, you know, I don't know. I like to think of the short stories as like these little starbursts, these little glimpses, you know, so no novellas is slightly different. That's somewhere in the middle, I guess. Novellas feel like a short novel to me, almost, you know, similar. Yeah. Now, are you more of a plotter or a pantser? Meaning do you, you know, plot your stories out, have outlines, or are you more like writing from the seat of your pants? Well, with short stories, I, I definitely don't outline. Um, although, I, you know, I'll take some notes first, and I usually have a, I know what the beginning is, I'll usually have a vague notion of the end. Uh, novels, especially at the beginning, I, I found it very helpful to write, like, plot outlines first. Mm-hmm. Um, and partly, that was the suggestion of my agents, because I, I got my agent with a novel that we were unable to sell. Uh, which was fine. I'm kind of glad that novel is in the world, <laughs> uh, but it did its job. I learned and, you know, it got me my agent, which is a huge deal. Um, and part of the issue with that novel is it was plotless. I mean, it was sort of purposely plotless, but it didn't have a lot of plot. Yeah. And I had this idea for a detective novel. My agent was like, well, if it's a detective novel, you probably should have some plots. Like, why don't you, <laughs> why don't you write, try writing like an outline of, so you know, sort of what the core mystery is, which uh, for me at the time was, you know, the advice I needed to hear excuse me so i'd say for novels about like two-thirds of the time maybe less at this point three-fifths uh doing math sorry (laughs) um (laughs) i I have written some form of an outline you know some sometimes it's been like oh it's a full like 10 pages sometimes i really only outline a part that i think is sticky and then like the rest is hand wavy and sometimes i've been professionally forced to have outlines where like if i'm at the start of a new deal typically my publisher and editor want to see you know if i don't have the whole book done maybe they'll make an offer if i have like 50 pages done and then a summary 
you know, and that was the case for the comic at the end of the world. I had like, I turned in like 40 ish pages with a summary, and then they made a, an offer on that. Um, and same with the Paul Bearers Club. But I would say, like, you know, the last book I just turned in uh, that'll be out next summer, I didn't write like a, I didn't write a, a full outline for it. I sort of outlined it as I went. Like I would write something and maybe peek ahead a little bit. So I think I sort of end up with like a weird outline, but it's more just like a bunch of unorganized notes. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I try to tailor it to, I, I think, what the needs of, I think, the book will will, will need to have. Um, so it's a really long answer. So sometimes I do both, but yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever. Sometimes what works for one story won't work for another one. And just, exactly. It's funny. Yeah. For me, I, growing up, I loved, like I said, I, met, I watched all the movies like Jaws, Evil Dead, all these yeah. different movies. My, my father took us everything. So um, I loved writing as well. And it was funny. Like I was, for some reason, I was severely shy as a kid. But the only time I really felt comfortable would I would write these stories and get them in front of the class. But there was one word I never knew back when I was eight or nine years old. It's a word called plagiarism. <laughs> I'll tell you what I mean. <laughs> uh, when Jaws came out, came out with a great novel called Shark. When Close Encounters came out, boy, I wrote UFO. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but most recently, because I have cerebral palsy, and um, I was doing stand-up comedy for a while, and uh -huh. somebody says, you'd be a great motivational speaker for my students. And I said, where do, you, where do you teach? He said, it's a place called Abilities Beyond. So I went there, and I was talking to people about what they want to do. And somebody said, you know, I, I would love to be a writer. I said, well, why don't you? And we're going on. I said, you know, when I was little, I used to write. She goes, well, I said, I would love to get back into it. She goes, well, why don't you? I said, ah, get me back with my own words. So <laughs> she taught me, she gave me this something called Wattpad, which you could write stories on there. I started doing that. I had five stories and my friend said, do you mind if I, he was trying to start his own publishing company. Said, do you mind if I publish your stories? I said, yeah, I would love you to. So I have it on uh, KDP. It's on Amazon. Did a couple of book uh -huh. signings at Barnes and Noble. But for me, it was similar to the same thing. I just wrote five short stories so far, but I would do the same thing. I would just write different things down. And I think I got this from Stephen King's on writing. I could be wrong, but one time when I was not, couldn't think of anything. And I think it was his book. He said, just write anything. You could be a yeah. piece of shit, but you never know. It could take you in a completely different direction. And it happened several times. And wow, there was one time, I don't know if this ever happened to you. I was so into my writing where I, I said, I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. And I almost didn't realize that I'm the one creating this story. It just <laughs> kept on flowing. So did anything like, anything like that ever happen to you where you're just so into it? You're like, it just, you weren't even thinking about what you were doing. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's sort of like the sensation of like, like Stephen King describes as like falling into the page or falling into the hole of the yeah. page. I can't say I've ever actively thought, Oh, I can't wait to see where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that would sort of like pull me out of, of, yeah. what, of what's what, but I also, I typically don't write in like big giant chunks like chunks like that. I'm I'm pretty even though I guess I publish quite a bit relatively slow. I feel like, you know, 500 words in a day is like a, is a good day. Uh so, yeah, I I don't get that sort of I definitely get lost in the story or, or lost in sort of the mechanics of what's going on, but do you write only when inspired or do you just say, you know what, this is a job I need to write, I need to write 500, a minimum 500 words. So I have a break during class. I'm going to write now. Or do you just say, you know what, I can't even think of anything. I just need to take a break and I'll try and write tomorrow. Oh, well, I mean, I think, you know, for mental health, everybody sort of has to, like, you have to allow for yeah. life to intrude or, you know, for bad days and stuff like that. But no, like I, um, you know, I, I, I would say almost all the time I don't feel like writing and I force myself to write sort of joking, but no, I mean, that's, that's the deal. That's the only way, like something, you know, if I've got a deadline, it's this book's got to get done. Like I can't, I can't miss that deadline. Yeah. Um, and the deadlines help, you know, to motivate me to get me back into the chair, but you know, and the more like the more often you go and sit down and write, the easier it becomes to continue sort of that pattern. Um, it gets harder. Like when you miss like a few days in a row or like right now, like in the midst of, the return to school so like september is, is you know it's pretty tough to get some stuff done so now it's actually it's kind of harder to go back because you know i've had excuses to to miss days because i've been so busy at the other job yeah well i, I interviewed brian keen several years ago and he he told me he said he goes i treat it like a job i write eight hours a day well i mean that you know that's his only yeah. job just writing so i mean besides he does other things too but he says i treat it for i'll write eight hours a day no matter what and it's just like he's and Jeff Strand's another one. I love Jeff Strand yeah. stuff, and he says he, he feels like the uh, the gerbil on the wheel. 
He just I gotta keep on going. He, I said, How do you come up with all these things? He goes, I just can't stop. He goes, I gotta pay the bills. So yeah, yeah. So that, that definitely a, a big uh, motivation. Gotta pay the bills and get, gotta make that deadline. Right. Now for you, because this sometimes this happens to me, like when I can think of something like when I'm not really thinking, you know what I mean? Like I'm just yeah. there's no pressure, but somebody said, Rich, you need to get this done by five o'clock today. I'll have a brain freeze. So when you have a deadline, yeah. it's coming up. Does that ever happen to you? Or just like, or does it, do you just treat it like, an, you know, any other day? Um, so I, I can't say I've ever really sort of been under sort of the the deadline like that, where it's like, hey, you have to have something at five. But usually it's like, hey, yeah. here's a novel. It's due in a year or it's due in this. So it's, it's a much longer term uh, deadline. Although with In Bloom, actually, that, that's probably a more closer example, whereas like they came to me with not as much lead time. I think they came to me like February. It's like, hey, can you write us something by April? So that felt like, oh, you know, that could be tricky because <laughs> I'm doing all this movie stuff. And um, but it was also was good motivation to, you know, to get it done. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. For me, the power of the deadline is definitely a helpful thing. Well, speaking, it's a great segue. So I want to talk about that. The Cabin at the End of the World was adapted by M. Night Shyamalan called Knock at the Cabin. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I do have to say, I, I read that book. I loved it when it first came out. And Thank I you. saw the trailer. And I said, <laughs> what a ripoff. Because I didn't, I didn't realize that, that they were adapting it. I said, oh, my God, I can't believe right. M. Night Shyamalan is ripping off Paul Tremblay. Then I saw your name. So did they do that in a way where I, they didn't really – published it that much that you know it was adapted from you at first like i didn't right. i thought m night Shyamalan. you know they're trying to sell it with that name was it was that like intentional on their part uh oh yeah wholly intentional on their part yeah uh to keep the book out of marketing for yeah i guess i won't speak for them but for yeah for for various reasons that i found quite frustrating frankly um but yeah <laughs> i mean that was yeah that was definitely purposeful on universal and, and knight's part yeah. yeah well i guess as long as the check comes in <laughs> you're good <laughs> and from what i read that the rights were purchased back in 2018 so what took so long uh well so it was optioned in 2018 so oh, option yeah you okay. know so when they optioned it, they only rent like access to it for 18 months so they didn't actually purchase the rights until spring of 21 because that's when they start film that's when they started filming so, you know, they renewed the option once or twice, uh, which is cool. Like initially, you know, for the first couple of years, really the first year and a half was they had two young screenwriters working on the screenplay. When I say they, it was Film Nation, the production company. Um, and then in 2019, they, they they tried, well, they almost had a couple of different directors on board, but it was going to be kind of hard for them to do it because they were trying to squeeze in that movie before something else. And mm. it didn't work out with them, but. Toward the end of the summer of 2019, uh, I started hearing that, oh, I'm Night Shyamalan, read the screenplay, is really interested as in producing it. Um, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. Uh, you know, and then the pandemic uh, the pandemic hits and we're sort of waiting around. And then it became, oh, no, he actually uh, wants to do this as his next movie. He just has to finish old first. So then I was like, oh. you know, that felt a little bit more real. I'm like, well, we'll see what happens, you know, waiting around for old to be done. And then, yeah, after old came out i think that was the summer of 21 it it started moving quickly the fall of 21 uh yeah so like it was a lot of like hurry up and wait for three plus years and then you know once it became hey knight's gonna do this then you know things happened fairly quickly did they ever offer you to write the screenplay no you know that wasn't that's typically something you well that's simply something you negotiate in the option yeah uh like you sort of negotiate everything in the options just so it's there. Like if, if they, if they pivot to buying the rights, you don't have to renegotiate everything. Uh, you know, so at the time of 2018, I never threw my hat to the ring. I would have liked to have tried. Um, but I don't think anyone would have been interested in that then. Um, so we'll see if anything else uh, were to get made. You know, I am trying to see if I can have a a little, I don't want to say a little more control, but maybe a little more say in things, whether that's yeah. as a producer or as a screenwriter, who knows? Well, that was my next question. Did you um, have any input of how the movie would go? Zilch, none. Zilch, no. no. Okay. <laughs> well, from what I remember I, several years ago, I think you said that Head Full of Ghosts was also optioned. Is that still in the works? Yeah. It's, a movie? Yeah, it's been under option since 2015, which is yeah. a long time. Uh, you know, on one hand, it's I can't complain too much. It's like 
free option money every 18 or so months. Yeah. Uh, it came, it's come really close twice to being a film. It might have filmed the summer of, what was it, 2018, maybe? Yeah. No, summer of 2019, it might have filmed. But then, like, the head of Focus left, and that sort of messed everything up. And then they had a new director attached, and there was actually announcements about Scott Cooper directing it mm -hmm. um, in early 2020. But then, obviously, the pandemic had happened. Yeah, you know, they were going to shoot. They were planning on filming in the summer of 2020, but obviously that didn't happen. And then the financer backed out. Yeah. but I'm still the, the original pair the original teams of producers are still attached uh, they kind of have it feels like one last shot at it <laughs> uh, the option was supposed to run out in November but that option has been extended because of the strike so uh, so we'll see I mean I think you know I think they have a director they might have a screenplay I haven't talked to them in months so I'm not sure so we'll see uh, the, the closest thing to being a, a film thing would be Survivor Song. I can't say by whom, but yeah, uh, yeah that, that's something that could move forward once all the strike, or I mean, the writer strike has been agreed upon, but like once both strikes are sort of ended, all the uh, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, you know, Survivor Song could start moving forward, but we'll see. Oh, good. Well, I mean, now that, you know, Knock at the Cabin came out and I think it was, a, it was, it was pretty successful, I think. So, and so now they'll look at that and say, well, he's looking at all his other novels. Like, I think Paul Bear's That's Club. Would make, yeah, Paul Bear's Club, I think, would make a great movie, too. I, I love that one. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. No real bites on that one. It is sort of a strange novel. I think, you know, it's it's hard to maybe get a, I don't know. Uh, I think it would be a challenge to, to do as a movie or as a show, just in terms of, like, how, how do you make your way in? But thank you. I, I would love to see someone give it a shot. Hey, you know what? Maybe if I can raise the money. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see go. if I can make it. For yeah. Now we we've been going back and forth talking about it, but I want to talk about how this got started. The first book I mentioned to you was when I first heard of you was a head full of ghosts. So I want to talk about how um, Charles Manson doesn't answer my letters became a head full of ghosts. <laughs> I love that title. So tell me how it went from that to a head full of ghosts. Yeah. So I guess I'll even start even before that Manson novel. And so, so I had, a first, a very brief go around with big publishers in 2009, 2010. Uh, Henry Holt, uh, which is a part of Macmillan, I believe, published uh, a novel called The Little Sleep, uh, which features a narcoleptic private detective, Lithuanian, in South Boston. <laughs> um, and the follow up, No Sleep to Wonderland. First book did okay. The second book was Dead on Arrival. Like there was no push behind it. Uh, my editor, my acquiring editor left, which is never a good sign. Uh, so for a whole variety of reasons, you know, those two books didn't sell and Holt didn't want to publish any more of my books. And frankly, I didn't want to publish any more of them either. But, you know, so I spent honestly like a few years, like licking my wounds and sort of being bitter and upset because you think, oh, the dream is you get with a big publisher and everything is fine now. But, you know, I, I learned the hard way that it's not. You still really have to do a lot of your own promotion and do a lot of your own advocation. And you need an editor that's, you know, uh, behind your work and and sort of powerful within the publisher and all that stuff. So uh, I guess around 2012-ish, uh, I'd started this book that you had mentioned, Charles Manson Doesn't Answer My Letters, which is a fun title. Uh, it was going to sort of be about like an eighth grader who wants to end the world. But he's not like an evil kid. He's, he's It's almost like a euthanasia sort of concept of ending the world. And like he's writing letters to Charles Manson, who at the time was still alive. Um, you know, looking for I don't know not advice so much but he's telling the story to Manson um so I got like a hundred you know I, I probably for only had like a hundred pages after a year and I was just really struggling with it and it wasn't going anywhere so like February of 2013 um I was doing other things instead of writing like and I was calling it research so I was just reading all these books and I I, I came across Centipede Press's book uh called The Exorcist Studies in the Night Film. Centipede Press has put out a bunch of volumes in their Studies in the Night Film sort of uh, series. You know, they have one on The Shining, they have one on Night of the Living Dead and Salem's Lot, stuff like that. So I read this book and it was just really interesting. It was all these essays about The Exorcist. You know, some of them were critical essays. You know, some of them were talking about the politics of the movie and the time that the movie was made. And, and I'd never really thought of the movie in those terms. So it was really interesting to me. So I remember I put the book aside and I was like, huh, like no one's really written a possession story in a while. How would I write one? 
Um, and so instantly I sort of had like the idea of the book kind of, well, I mean, I should say instantly, but pretty quickly, you know, it was the quickest sort of like a book just sort of like landed on my lap. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was kind of a hard decision to be like, oh, is this just the new shiny thing that's interesting to me or, or should I work on this instead of the Manson book? So it was kind of hard to put the Manson book aside. That was like a hundred pages, but I dove into a head full of ghosts and, you know, luckily, (laughs) thankfully I did. So you didn't tell your editor at the time that you changed what you were doing. Oh, my agent. Yeah. I had no agent at that time. Yeah. Yeah. He thought I was still working on that book. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So in like July, he's like, Hey, how's that Manson book coming? It's like, well, (laughs) I have this instead, a hundred pages of this thing. I'm calling it, you know, a a head full of ghosts. And he didn't get it initially. Which I also totally get because it wasn't done. It was only like a hundred pages, and yeah, um, I was really worried. I was like, "Oh man," he gave me some feedback that wasn't like I didn't find super helpful. It was more like, "Ah, does this have to be in first person?" But again, in his defense, he didn't know what the rest of it was going to be. So that was also a hard thing to do too, to be like, "Well, I'm just trust- trusting my gut. I'm going to write this book, and then we'll deal with it after. If he doesn't want to sell it, then I don't know. We'll, we'll have to figure something else out." Yeah. But happily, he loved the book as soon as he read it. He's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Um, and we were able to sell it. Yeah. So that's such a great premise, too. Like, like we talked about some modern day exorcists where this girl, she might be possessed and the family needs the money. So they make it into a reality show. And right. It's such a great book. And I remember when I read it, I said, and I was thinking, I said, this would be such a great movie. And I, that, that's when I said, I cannot wait to read Anything and everything that Paul Tremblay comes out. Oh, with. thanks, Rich. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I'm a huge fan of your work. That's why I'm looking forward to. Uh, I said I listened to him bloom this morning. It just came out today, and I can't wait to see what's you're coming out next year. <laughs> Great. Did they? Uh, can I ask? Did they do two narrators for In Bloom, or yes. is it? Yeah, there was okay, a cool. girl yeah. for the first part, and then right. it was funny because I'm listening to it in my car, and I thought maybe I hid something. I said, Did "Oh yeah, story," <laughs> and I realized yeah, yeah. it's the guy telling the story to the girl at the uh, Good right. Friends Diner. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> this answer actually is funny. I um, I asked this question, and somebody stood up and said, "I have the answer to this," and it was it was your father. Oh I boy, asked, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I asked if your characters in the stories were based on real people, and. What did your father tell me? I don't know if you remember. <laughs> oh, I mean, he's like, he probably said something like, yeah, he's like used me and killed me in a bunch of his stories. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I have certainly put my parents through the ringer or characters that are standing for my parents. They're good sports. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think most author, you know, not all my characters, but certainly some start off with like maybe even just physical parts of people I know or yeah. little bits. But the fun part for me is how quickly they become these totally made up people. Uh, and I don't think of them as like other, you know, a- as like, oh, this was based on my brother. Or this was based on the friend. Um, I like to I like to tease people with it. Like, you know, hey, hey this this character was based on you uh, with the, maybe the exception of the Paul Bears Club, which is very sort of autobiographical, purposefully so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, writers, I mean, we have to you know, use everything. Right, you know, yeah. They say, well, it's funny because I met John Grisham at a book signing and he was saying there was one story he wrote and he said the guy that was a judge and he just made him to a complete asshole. And he was he went back to where he lives down south and he goes, I'm so worried. I think the guy's gonna be so mad at me when he went back home. He's like, oh, my God, you put me in the book. Thank you very much. He said he was <laughs> so happy that he just sure. he goes, you based the guy on me. And he goes, I thought you were going to be pissed. He goes, no way. This is great. So people just like, you know, they just like their. 10 minutes of fame 15 minutes yeah of no i mean you know it's probably a little bit different for like you know family yeah. as opposed to like you know not a random person but like you know because you know the family is always like oh my god this is based on this and this is yeah. based on that so that i know they have a different reading experience but oh yeah i like i get excited if there's a character sort of loosely based on me or something like that which john langan has done a couple times yeah. which is fun it was funny for one of my stories i wrote about these two young boys and my brother was laughing so he goes when i'm reading this he goes this is me and you this is me and jeff like we we're going back and forth like all said yes yeah. I, I put us into the stories i just changed the names and exaggerated some of the parts but i did the same thing i said i put a lot of my parents in there put my brothers yeah. in there some some uncles i just had fun with it sure absolutely <laughs> so tell me oh well, actually i want to talk, i'm going to get into this first i want to go back a little bit so tell me why august 19th 2015 was such a special day for you yeah so a head full of ghosts had, it was published in early june of 2015 uh but the date that you just said 
was the day that Stephen King tweeted about reading A Head Full of Ghosts. Uh, and he said, A Head Full of Ghosts scared the living hell out of me. I'm, and I'm not easy to scare. That is uh, which is you know, such an amazing yeah. you know, tweet. I think, you know, just how he phrased it, like really sort of took off online. Uh, no, it's, that remains like a top top three professional moment for me. Yep. And people don't realize, maybe some people don't realize a quote from him means a lot. And I'll tell you what I mean. I used to be a manager at Rite Aid and we sold, we had, we sold paperbacks and that movie is, or the book, a simple plan we were selling. And somebody came up to the desk and said, I want to buy this book. I said, well, it's a great movie. It's a great book. I'm only buying it because Stephen King says it's great. On the back, he has a quote. Yeah. I said, well, Stephen <laughs> King is correct. I said, and she bought it just because of what he said on the back. So it, it, something that he says does mean a lot to people. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, and he's very gracious with, you know, book recommendations and helping out other writers. So, you know, which is amazing. Yeah. I don't know how he does. I mean, I want to get your opinion on this because I know one of the things he said in his book on writing is just, if you want to be a great writer, just read everything and it seems like this guy i don't know when he has a chance to write or do anything else he seems like he reads so much he he, he goes through all the books he reads in a year so for you do you have that same um same work ethic where like if you read as much as you can and that sort of helps you with the uh your writing yeah absolutely i mean that's how i learned how to write like i i didn't you know we talked about me getting a math degree i didn't get a degree in writing uh so i learned by reading uh and you know and since geez I would say since 1995, you know, I probably, you know, read on average, like between 60 and 80 novels a year. Wow. You know, sometimes more, I should say books, not all just novels, sometimes, you know, nonfiction and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, these days, you know, I squeeze them in with audiobooks, mm -hmm. whether uh, like I'm driving to school or, or what, if I was taking my dog for a walk, I would do actually a lot of nonfiction that way. Um, but yeah, no, I, I feel like if I'm not reading, I feel like my writing suffers. Like I need to, I need to have that connection. Yeah. I'm the same way. I love reading. And so what I do is I, I listen to a lot of nonfiction and audible, and then I read fiction just for some reason. I just like, like listening, sometimes listening to fiction. Sometimes I'm at a red light. I'm somebody cuts in front of me. I lose track. I'm like what's going on. But like yeah. nonfiction, it seems like I'm just listening to a podcast or whatever, but I just always have to be reading something, listening to something. I'm just, I just love, love having them. And I'm, I'm old school. I just love actually having a book in my hand. I I'm not really a big fan of the Kindle. I'm not, I mean, which yeah, same. So I guess it shows my age, but yeah, I just love having <laughs> the, the, the old fashioned hardcover of the, even the paperback in my hand, but I'm, I'm a big fan of audible for the reason you just said, like, you know, mm -hmm. I love driving and I have maybe 45 minutes to drive to work. So I'll just yeah, put on, put on a book. Yeah. So listen absolutely. To music. When I, when I said I wanted to go back is because you had the Stephen King tw um, tweet in August 19th or, but I heard you mention this, that you said for most writers, especially now, if the first book isn't a huge success, you become poisoned to the publisher. Mm -hmm. So his tweet actually gave you a second chance because you had the first two books, 2009, 2010, yeah. and then you had a little bit of a lull of a period there. And then you came back with head full of ghosts. And then his tweet shot you right back into the, the scene again. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, the book, the book did okay, did pretty well. Like when it first came out, it critically did really well. It got like, you know, me a New York times review for the first time, yeah. but, but no doubt the Stephen King tweet sort of, it, it changed the book. It turned the book into a, a, I would call it a cult hit because there were a few books that most books only have like a shelf life of two months. When I say shelf life, you know, only sort of makes sales for two months. Mm -hmm. So like a head full of ghosts was never a bestseller, but it just consistently continues, you know, to sell. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, it's still on bookshelves. It's still like, you know, in the top like 15,000 on Amazon. Like, you know, that's pretty remarkable for a book that's like eight years old. Uh, knock on wood. Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you keep going. I mean, you know, it, it's just really cool that people are still reading and discovering that book. It's, it's, it's exciting. Well, another one of my favorite authors is Greg Isles. And I heard him mention this. He said that he goes, his publishers always said, Basically, I want you to write the same book with a different title. And he, every time, I mean, I'm not sure if you like his stuff, but he will write one book about Nazis, next book's about religion, next book's about, he's got the uh, Pen Cage series. So every book, and he said it wasn't until he found out that, that they found out how successful he was with a different subject, a different genre that they said, you know what, yeah. you have carte blanche, you can do whatever you want. Did you encounter that same issue with the publishers? Well, so like with Henry Holt, I, it's funny, I even told my agent, though I had no right to because I was a nobody, <laughs> didn't know anything. I wrote The Little Sleep and I was like, hey, I know a lot of places want like series, especially if it's a detective character. It's like, this is the only book I'm writing. Like, this is his story. 
He's like, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so of course, Henry Holt was the only one that made an offer and they wanted two books, the second book to feature the same character. Mm -hmm. So I figured there were worse problems in life than having to write another book with the same character. But that was really hard. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done writing wise. Uh, it was just hard to find what that next story was. I'm glad I did it. That was actually a huge, uh, huge step forward for me. I feel like in my writing, you know, a, a big learning experience, you know, writing a second Mark Genovich book. You know, with, with, uh, with William Morrow, I'm very fortunate that my editor and the publisher, you know, they want horror fiction from me, although they'll call it psychological suspense, really. <laughs> yeah. you know, it doesn't really say horror on the spine. But either way, I'm very fortunate that they have a sort of a very wide or allow me to have a very wide definition of what a horror story is or looks like. Um, so I definitely don't feel like I'm writing the same book over and over again. Uh, you know, you can say many things about my writing, but <laughs> that's not one of them. Well, that's good. I say I love that about yeah. authors, but I know that some people said they were sort of pigeonholed into the first book was so successful. It's like, just keep writing right. that. And I think it'll, sometimes a lot of bands have the same problem with if you've tried something different, the fans are like, oh, they sold out. Oh, they're not the yeah. same anymore. It's like some people don't like change, which I love right. change. I think it's yeah. good. And you, you grow as a writer, you grow as a musician yeah. and you want to you want to do something different. So I, I, I love the fact that you're able to do that. Yeah, I mean, people are lazy. Look, I'm lazy. Everyone's lazy <laughs> at certain points. Like, you know, you want the same, you you like this, or you want that again, because it's yeah. comfort. Yeah, you know, it takes, you know, even sort of passively either watching art or reading it uh, or listening to it, it takes work to try something new. But that's usually part of the joy. That's usually the thing that opens up something new. Uh, you know, people forget that. And, you know, and publishers, again, if they know book A was like this and book B is similar to it, they already have a plan in place. Yeah. So it's... You know, it's sort of hard to overcome that. <laughs> we'll call it entertainment entropy. Entropy. How's that? <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> All right. So was it difficult for you to follow up A Head Full of Ghosts because that book was so successful? And then I love A Disappearance of Devil's Rock. That was your book right after that. Yeah. Did you already in your mind know what you were going to do after A Head Full of Ghosts became so popular? or No, uh, it was very hard. And <laughs> A Head Full of Ghosts. So I'm trying to think. So I had started writing disappearance of devil's rock and i think i'd written most of it before a head full of ghosts had come out mm -hmm. um or yeah so i mean i was definitely a, a good chunk of the way into the book before it exploded or you know when a head full of ghosts did really well i think i was at the end of disappearance of devil's rock but no i was second guessing myself the whole time i was like ah oh, you know this feels like a lot harder uh it's not coming as easy as a head full of ghosts did you know and part of that's like the glow of the afterglow of memory like you you remember this book being easier than it was kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but no, that was after No Sleep to Wonderland, Disappearance of Devil's Rock was probably my second most difficult write, uh, but also super rewarding. You know, I'm very proud of that book. Uh, you know, a lot of, <laughs> you know, I think way more people know A Head Full of Ghosts in the Cabinet at the End of the World than some of the other ones. And Disappearance is sort of like the forgotten little gnome which is fine <laughs> yeah. uh but people who like that book really seem to like it which is kind of fun um, tell my viewers right now yeah. buy that book right after you're done watching this interview it's a great book i enjoy i think Thank i you. read it maybe if not one sitting two sittings it was just i couldn't wait to see what's gonna happen next the, the kids disappear and everybody's looking for them it's just yeah it's, it's a well, great thank you i appreciate that yeah oh you're very welcome so I, I want to get back to your writing process a little bit do you start off writing longhand or do you do everything on the computer uh if i'm writing like page one chapter one it's it's all computer i don't write any of the story itself longhand but you know i keep notes like you know at the beginning you just try to jot down ideas and stuff like that uh my handwriting is terrible <laughs> and i and i it, when i'm actually writing i need to be able to like cut and paste yeah uh, or cut and move and paste and stuff like that and if i try that longhand it's just not i've tried just to see what it's like and it just doesn't work out for me have you ever gotten so deep into writing a novel and you're almost done three quarters of the way done, you come up with a better idea and you say, you know what, I want to, I, you have to start all the way from the beginning because you're like, I, I know what I want to do with this character and it's not what, what I think is going to happen right here and you have to start all over again. Does that ever happen? Nope. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, so I, I mean, things change. Like I might have yeah. to change a scene or something, but I've never felt like I have to tear it up and restart from the beginning. I also... Like I do a lot of my editing as I go. I, I wish I was someone who could 
just spill that out all out and then rewrite it and rewrite it again. I just don't work that way. Like I'll go like 500 words and then like I'll re-edit those before I move on. And if it's a, a book, I usually start the chapter. So I move like very slowly forward, you know, which is why it takes like 12 months to 15 months. Is that what the average, uh, what they give you on an average to write a novel about a year? Um, Yeah, it's worked out that way. Um, I mean, <laughs> a couple of times we've had a, uh, the buffer of a short story collection, which is kind of fun because mm -hmm. uh, both short story collections def you know, had stories that had already been published. So it wasn't like I had to write the whole story collection from scratch. Um, so that's given me some, some of my novels, like a little bit of extra time than just a year. So, so you, how many, I know, so you basically do a chapter or two at a time, or a couple chapters at a time. And then, do you know what the ending is going to be before you finish the book? Or sometimes you're writing and you say, you know what, this is I, I think I'm good. Not that you have to change everything all over, but yeah, do you uh, change what you think is the ending is going to be, and you come up with something better while you're writing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that definitely happened. Like in the case of the cabinet at the end of the world, I will say I generally have a notion of what the ending is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it might be sort of a foggy notion, but like I usually, obviously I know the beginning <laughs> and I know mostly the ending and the hard, you know, the part is how do I get from A to B? But yeah, sometimes, you know, the ending hasn't changed like to be something completely different uh, th than what maybe what I initially imagined. Um, but, you know, that's sort of like a, a fun part too, is like you think you, or I think I know the major parts of the story and then something unexpected happens and it's cool to see how that fits in yeah. and works in and at the end you know the book is always different than the thing that you imagine it might be in your head but that's not necessarily a bad thing either what's funny is i, I don't know which author says you might know i heard stephen king in an interview and he said there's one author that he likes would the first thing he would write would be the last line of the novel and then he would write <laughs> the novel as, and he yeah. said he was, that's just not how i write i, I yeah. can't imagine doing that it's like all right this is it this is gonna be like and then he would just go start the end and go all the way you know to the beginning and go to the end yeah. but that to me that would be i don't know it could be and maybe he does change it afterwards because if i was in the middle of writing and it's like oh wait you know i never even thought of this let's see where this goes and take it somewhere that you didn't originally think yeah i mean it's goes to show there's so many different ways there's no one yeah. right way to write a story you just have to find what works yeah. for you and what works for that story yeah. The one thing I, I found interesting is when I interviewed Owen King, he said he wasn't sure if he wanted to be a writer because he thought it was such a lonely job. He'd see his mother in one room writing, his father in another room writing. Uh -huh. He said, it seems so lonely. He goes, then I realized when I started writing, he goes, I have so many people in this room, meaning all the characters that he's writing. He goes, it's actually, uh -huh. I, I, there's too many people in the room when I start writing. So did you ever have that problem where, or are you just like the solitude of writing or just like, you know, I just, you know, are you, for me, I, I love the solitude of it. I just love being alone. I love nobody bothering me and I just get a lot done. Do you prefer that type or do you, do you have to have total silence? Uh, I think I prefer silence, although that really sort of happens, especially, you know, when you have, you know, kids at home. Yeah. So I, I learned how to write with music. So I never felt alone. I, you know, I could hear people moving around, which is fine. Yeah. But also like, even like, I don't know. I, I'm typically not writing for more than two hours at a stretch. You know, if I go two hours, I'll take a break and do it again. So it doesn't feel like, you know, I have a friend, Jeremy Robert Johnson, who will like cloister himself in a, in a motel for like four days and write for like 20 hours each day or something crazy. I was like, man, I can't do that. It's not something I could do. Yeah. You know, so he's like a binge, we call that a binge writer. I'm definitely not a binge writer. Yeah. I'm a, the tur I'm the tortoise in the hair. I'm the, yeah. You know, a little bit every day, you know, you know, and that you'd be surprising, like, you'd be surprised, you know, how that adds up, how that builds. Yeah. You know who else writes? Like, I read an interview with Greg Isles, and he said that, say he has a year to write the book, for 10 months, he wouldn't write anything. He would just be going through it in his head, thinking about, thinking about it. And he said, he goes, I, I never, he goes, I, hopefully my editor's not listening because basically it's a first draft because he'll just like pour it out. He'll write sometimes like, 25 26 hours straight it'll just you know morning to yeah. to night to dawn and it'll just keep on writing and writing because he though throughout the whole year he's just thinking about it in his head going over going over and then he already knows yeah. exactly what he's going to put down but yeah huh. i think i i would i if i was a writer like that i would not be able to do it either i would be more like you just like a little bit here a little bit there edit it go back and... yeah um you mentioned uh about the ending of uh cabin at the end of the world it's I'm sure people who I'm not giving anything away, but did you prefer your ending to M Knight's ending? 
Oh, my ending, of course. I, yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, I, I was a little disappointed in the movie when it came to that. But for the most part, it seems like it was... From, I've re- I read Cabinet at the End of the World when it first came out, so some of the details are a little foggy, but sure. it, like it was pretty true to it. To the yeah. first half of it, anyway. Uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, the first two thirds of the movie and the yeah. book line up, you know, pretty much, you know, super close. And then, you know, without spoiling anything, there's uh, something that happens to a character in the book that doesn't happen in the movie. And that yeah. really changes the story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not a huge spoiler. The movie is much less ambiguous than what happens in my book. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I'm sure you know this story with uh, Pete, um, in Jaws, Peter Benchley's novel, The Shark Just Gets Tired and Sinks to the Bottom of the Ocean. So um, when when Steven Spielberg had the oxygen tank, he blew up the shark, and he, Peter Benchley's like, "This is stupid. Nobody's gonna believe this." Deal. <laughs> I've had this audience for two uh, an hour and fifty four minutes. Trust yeah. me on this. So he said he went to the screening. Shark blew up. People stood up, chaired. They sat down. Yeah. Friends went up. They stood up, chaired again. He says, "You know, Stephen, gotta tell you, I apologize. I was wrong." Yeah. <laughs> that, that was one ending where the movie was actually well. I mean, I'm sure you know the story of that too. Like, yeah, it eventually was writing a screenplay, and Spielberg and Carl Gottlieb like, yeah, we got this because they just didn't like the, what he was coming out with, and yeah, yeah. There was a whole. Do you, I'm sure you you read that book, right? You yeah. know, I I haven't read the book. Uh, oh, okay. I like the movie so much, but I know there's like an uh, an affair. Yeah, yeah. An affair with Brody. Hooper, Bro- and, sorry, Hooper and uh, Mrs. Brody. Ellen, the, yeah, Ellen Brody. Yeah, yeah. Ellen Brody, and then there's also he has the mayor has ties to the mafia. There's a lot of things in there. Yeah, that they, yeah. you know, they just made it late. The, the the movie is it's one of those usually. 90% of the time, I like the book way better than the movie. That was the one time where I said the book was. I mean, the movie was way better than the book, but. Yeah, no, I that I mean, I kind of hope. <laughs> I think every writer hopes, like, oh, geez, I hope I don't end up on that short list of the movie was better than the book. Uh, I mean, I'd be totally okay with, hey, the the book and the movie are both really good. They're both two yeah. different things. Yeah. You know, an example of that would be like uh, the movie Arrival, based on Ted Chang's story, uh, the story of our life. Yeah. Uh, both are both are wonderful. Yeah. What's well, funny, I'm, I was watching an interview, I, I want to say with Stephen King and James Patterson, and uh, he, they had an interview, people were saying like, oh man, I love this movie, I love the Misery movie, I love Shawshank Redemption, and he yeah. said, you know I write books, right? <laughs> <laughs> they said, unfortunately, some of, a lot of the fans were like, just going right to the movie and saying, I love your stuff. He's like, no, no, you got to read the book too. Said, I'm just the opposite, I love reading the book, and if a movie comes out, that makes me want to go back to the book if I didn't have a chance to read it and read that. Yeah. Like another one, I love uh, Michael Crichton. I love his stuff. His books are way better than any of the movies. I mean, the only yeah. one that came close for me was Jurassic Park. Yeah. But I mean, most of the adaptations, you got to read the Michael Crichton books over the, uh, the adaptations. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'm, I know I'm in the minority, but like I will off if it's a book I really love, like I, I'll probably avoid seeing the movie just because I know it'll, It'll change the things that I had in my head about that book. It's hard not to, or like you have to go back and read the movie or read the book. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I know exactly what you mean. It's like sometimes I'm like that. It's like, oh, uh, actually, the perfect example is that um, Grady Hendrix. I love the Exorcism novel, and I said I cannot watch that movie because I said I love that book. I don't. Even, yeah, it's, it's just going to kill it for me. And you mentioned that he started writing short. He's part of that creature feature collection too. I didn't listen yes. to his story yeah. yet, but I cannot wait because I met him at the uh, Merrimack book festival and such a great guy he's supposed to be on the show sometime soon and speaking of that i know that's going to be october 14th are you going to be there no i was going to but uh i had an offer to uh to appear at the saratoga book festival literary festival okay uh and my daughter is a freshman at skidmore Mm -hmm. and skidmore's in saratoga so it's like i can't turn down a chance to to go and see my daughter (laughs) at college because i miss her Yep, no, I don't so, believe. Yeah, it. I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna miss the Merrimack this year. All right, well, we'll have to see you next year. Because I, I know I was, I was mad. I think last was it last year was the first time they had it since COVID, from what I remember. Because there was a couple of years that they didn't yeah. have it. So I'm glad they're they're finally getting back to that. Because I, I, yeah, I met so many great people. Like you, Jeff Strand, Brian King, Grady Hendrix. I mean, there's so oh, it's, a, it's a great event. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. I'm I'm sad. I'm gonna miss it, but family first. <laughs> I don't believe. It. Now, um, they say everything is cyclical. So horror had a great time in the 80s, and it seems like it's in the middle of a huge resurgence now, which is definitely good for you. I mean, you know, like, I, like yeah. you mentioned too, it's like, it's not really horror. You have a lot of humor in it, just as much as you have horror. And you have, it's, you have a good mixture. So you can't even really classify yourself as horror. Yeah. 
But um, so you missed you missed the leisure years, huh? Because I love 2007, 2008. I don't know if you're uh, like when Brian Keene, I'm trying to think of um, Ed oh, Lee. I, yeah, I'd read some of Tom Piccarelli's yeah. leisure books. Yeah. I remember like there was like summer 2008 when Borders was still around. I would just go through. I didn't even care who the author was. I just went through the yeah. whole thing like, and just. But then it seemed like, you know, horror dropped off for a while. Leisure went under all these different things. And uh, but I'm glad that people because remember, that used to be such a taboo word. Horror. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's that. Well, now, it still is for a lot of people. But yeah. Yeah. We talked about it a little bit. I want to go over this because I, I love this. Is the another novel of yours with a great premise is Paul Bear's Club, and you said that's very autobiographical for you. Yeah, uh, it's sort of like part of the idea of the book. Uh, this sort of high school, you know, self-identifies himself as a high school loser in the late '80s. Starts what's called the Paul Bear's Club, where he volunteers at local funeral home. And he and he's, he tries to get other people to join him to serve elderly and homeless that don't have a lot of living relatives, you know, which is a really nice community service thing to do. But also maybe it's a little bit morbid because dead people still. Um, and then like a strange woman who may be a few years old or maybe a few more years older joins the club, sort of becomes his friend slash frenemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and she may or may not be like some sort of weird uh, supernatural <laughs> being from a, a, a weird corner of New England folklore. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but like so, the autobiographical part is I sort of reimagined myself as this character yeah. who started, uh, or or what if the high school me had started this club, uh, and what would have happened to this version of me if he dropped out of high school to join punk bands and also had this weird sort of, uh, again, friend slash friend of me who may or may not be supernatural. This is sort of like your shining. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> although I don't know how, you know. I, I feel like I got way more autobiographical insofar as like these are things that happened to me in high school. Yeah. Uh, and these are, you know, I took a whole bunch of other things that happened to me, but sort of refracted it. Like, you know, this character had scoliosis, which is something I went through and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, similar to Kaiser Sose and Usual Suspects, who is Art Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> who is Art Barbara? Yeah, that's part of the fun. Uh, Read the book. I'm yeah. If, other yeah one. If, you, if you believe the character who's crossing out stuff, Art Barbara might be me. But yeah. Now, for you, I think you sort of mentioned this, and the reason I'm bringing this up was because I read an uh, interview with Don Cascarelli when he was writing Phantasm. He said he wanted to be inspired, so uh, no pun intended, but he went out to his cabin in the woods and said, I got to get away from everybody, and he just uh -huh. came out with Phantasm. Do you, but I think you already answered this. You have, you just write in your home with, you know, because you have the kids and the family. So you yeah. have a special spot where you go to be inspired. No, usually I'm I'm sort of in the room that I'm sitting at now. Uh, I did a lot more writing when I, in school in my sort of younger days. <laughs> I think before, certainly before like social media sort of took over. Yeah. So now I find myself like if, if there is free times, I'm sort of fulfilling. And I, I literally call them my social media duties, like having to, you know, I'm, I'm happy to interact, you know, with readers and stuff like that. But it is sort of part of the job as a writer. Um, so... And like in the there were, there's been times where like I you know I brought my son when he was younger to like a baseball clinic we we're going to be there for a couple hours, you know I'd have my laptop out and 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 headphones on and I wrote a big chunk of disappearance at Devil's Rock, sitting in Babson College uh, Babson College's like gymnasium with wow. baseballs moving around, uh, yeah I mean because it was like hey when do I have when else am I going to have two hours and it wasn't like he was playing a baseball game where I'm actively watching him it was like a clinic it was yeah you know, 50 kids doing drills. So like, I, I didn't feel parentally guilty by not watching, you know, all 50 kids go through the baseball drills. It's funny for me, when I'm writing, I don't mind music at all. Actually, I, I'd go to this coffee shop, just write, and there's music, jazz music playing. But whenever somebody's talking, I don't know, for some reason, yeah. I just cannot write, maybe because I listen to them, try not to listen to them speak. Oh yeah, you're focusing then, on the work. Yeah, conversation, sure. yeah. But with the music playing, that doesn't bother me at all. So I just like play, you know, some classical, some jazz, just even some rock music. Like, just like you, I love punk music. And uh -huh. it's, so, but yeah, for some reason, and it just, if people are talking, I just can't think clearly, but with the music, I can just write all day if I'm inspired or if I have, you know, if I feel like doing that. But I, I write longhand, so my arm, my hand gets cramped uh -huh. and it's like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I read an interview with Dan Brown where he said sometimes, actually most of the time with his stories, he will do maybe a year to two years of research before he even starts his novel. 
do you like doing research or do you, do you just come up with an idea and just go with it? That sounds like hell. One yeah. to two years of research. I guess um, I got my answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's unavoidable. I mean, there are certain books uh, you, you have to do research. So I'd say most books. Yeah. Um, even something I'm trying to think of Paul Bear's Club. Maybe I didn't have to do too much research there because most of it was was me. But even then, like, you know, I wanted to make sure I got like the the gear right for these bands. So I, you know, I asked a, you know, a musician friend and stuff like that. So, you know, some of my books have had various amounts of required research. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, part of the thing that you have to do. Um, the next book that I plan on starting, I do actually have to do quite a bit of research, which I'm a little bit dreading. Yeah. But maybe I could just sort of go through that quickly to get to the writing part of it. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, you know what? I'm gonna next when the next one comes out, definitely would love to have you back on the show and talk about that one. Yeah, thanks. Next summer is uh horror movie and novel is what's uh the title. It'll be out June twenty fifth, I believe. Can you give us an idea what it's about or no? Yeah, sure. It's so it's um I'm so bad at like a really brief description, but <laughs> uh so in the nineteen ninety three there were a bunch of you know, twenty somethings in Rhode Island and they made uh you know they made a movie like a, definitely like an art house pretentious disturbing horror movie uh so a very Gen X thing to do um and one of the characters he plays this character called the thin kid and in, in the movie that's all he's referred to as the thin kid um and he's now in present day recounting like he's basically the horror movie book that you have he's narrating it like it's the audiobook that you're listening to you're listening to the audiobook of his experience on set but also now his experience as they're trying to reboot or remake the movie mm -hmm. so it bounces back and forth between you know what happened in 93 and what's happening now because something terrible happened on set um which prevented the movie from going to screen initially but now like this movie has like such this reputation like so people sort of want to see it um and because I can't resist having some sort of typographical fun, uh, I include the entire screenplay of the original movie, uh, you know, in screenplay form. You know, it, it's cut yeah. up like it's it's intercut with like here's you know the narrator, here's a chunk of screenplay, then we're we're to this chapter, etc. Uh, so I'm making it sound like a mess, but I'm I'm really excited about this book. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's uh, I think it's really disturbing. Also. Uh, it's sort of like a mix of like <laughs> this disturbing horror story mixed with a little bit of Hollywood tell all memoir. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's so, funny. I mean, some of my experience with, with getting things made or, or not made <laughs> definitely informed, definitely informed that his going through the reboot sort of process. You mentioned, you know, growing up watching the creature feature, we talked about Jaws. What are some of your, what's your favorite type of horror movies? Do you like the old movies, older movies from the 60s, 70s, and 80s? And what do you compare to like the horror of today? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I like to think I'm sort of like all over the place, like eclectic, yeah. like different yeah. things. I mean, nothing makes me happier than seeing like a brand new movie that's made now that's like really amazing. Of course, I, you know, but I still love the movies that I love from the 80s. And like, yeah. if there's nothing else, like, oh yeah, I'm going to watch the thing again or yeah you know or i'll watch you know jaws again but um or like one of my favorite movies lake mungo which was made like 11 or 12 years ago i'm very excited to find out just recently that the director of lake mungo who sort of just disappeared from view like not actually disappeared yeah uh is like oh he has a movie that he produced that's coming out that sounds like a ton of fun so i'm super excited to see you know new things like that well, it's funny because you mentioned a movie at the when I saw it at the book signing, and I went out and rented it the next day, and I loved it. it was with Michael Shannon? I think it's called Take Shelter. Oh, Take Shelter! Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was such a great. I I I can't believe I missed that movie because I'm a huge Michael Shannon fan, and it, that was another one where you just, is he crazy? Is he not crazy? And it's just oh I, yeah, yeah, no, wonderful. I mean, I think that definitely subconsciously probably informed a head full of ghosts because I think that came out like 2012. Um, no, I love that movie. I wish I wrote that movie as a book. <laughs> What's funny is that you mentioned this, um, Head Full Ghost, the title anyway, was not influenced by any of your writing. What was it influenced by? Oh, so yeah, I started with a Bad Religion. Like when I had the idea for Head Full of Ghosts, it sort of coincided with Bad Religion putting out a record called True North. Um, and they had a song on it called My Head is Full of Ghosts. And that, that was just sort of like ringing through my head. So 
when I was writing the book, I was calling it My Head is Full of Ghosts. And we just sort of, my agent suggested we tweak it a little bit. Not because it was the same as the song. That would have been fine. Yeah. But he thought A Head Full of Ghosts was a stronger title. So it sounds like you like a lot of the 80s punk. Do you like Circle Jerks, Black Flag, Minor Threat, Fagazi, all those bands? Yeah. Um, so of those, you know, Black Flag, definitely. I'd say more like Who's Could Do, uh, yeah. the more Who's Could Do side of things. But yeah. Are you a fan of the Italian horror, like Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento? Uh, I, I have to admit that's sort of like a hole in my viewing. Like I've, I've yeah. sort of avoided watching almost all of those just because like I, I'm not a huge gore hound. Like yeah. some gore can just really get to me. Uh, yeah. yeah, you wouldn't so, yeah. like it then. And, and I know those are super, you know, famous for being super gory. So no, I don't. Oh, yeah. No, well, if, especially Fulci. Dario Argento is more cerebral. Fulci is just all out gore. It's, it's, yeah. For me, it's just it's fun. I have to say, because just like you, I have very eclectic taste. I love all types of movies. But since we're talking about horror, I think probably the best horror movie I've seen maybe in this year and maybe even last year was Talk to Me. I don't know if you heard about that. It was from Australia. Yeah, people seem to love that movie. I haven't had a chance to see it yet. It was one of those movies where sometimes I'm afraid if it gets too much hype, I'm, I'm going to go in there thinking like, that's yeah. it. I went in there, it's kept on, it was at the top of every list. And I said, how did I miss this? What? And I said, you know what, let me check it out. And I saw it three times already. It's, oh, wow. it's okay. as good as they're making it out to be. And the other one was Parasite, which really isn't a horror movie, but it's one of those. Oh, movies. I love Parasite. Yeah. Yeah. It's because it, the trailer did exactly what it was supposed to do. It just teased you. I said, what the hell is this about? And I said, I got to check it out. And I ended up seeing that one like three, four times too. Yeah. Right. No, that's a great one. Well, it's great having you on the show. Is there anything that I missed that you want to talk about? Oh boy, I don't think so. Uh, you mentioned In Bloom. Like I said, this is the first yeah. first podcast that's talking about In Bloom, so that's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you know, I just say, hey, keep an eye out on the Beast You Are, which came out this summer. Yeah, uh, in In Bloom. And thank you, Rich. I really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. It's great having you on the show, and at least I'd love to have you on next year when you come out with your next book. Which the way you described it, that's everything I want in a novel. I cannot wait to read that one. So, And I highly Thanks. recommend, if you haven't read some of those books we talked about, go out and buy them right now. That was Paul Tremblay. My name is Rich Sear. And uh, that wraps up the latest episode of The Claws Corner. A huge thanks goes out to author, editor, and teacher, Paul Tremblay, for taking time out of his extremely busy schedule to be a guest on my show. Thank you very much. Another thanks goes out to editor extraordinaire John Bristol of Emerald Productions for always doing a superb job editing this show each and every week and making it available to all. I am also extremely grateful to Joseph Timothy Quirk and Rob Bull for all they do to make my show available on several connected radio stations, as well as Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeartRadio. Thank you both very much. And lastly, but definitely not least, I need to thank you, the viewer, for always tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. Bye.